great to be here in Lisbon at Web Summit, my first time here, I'm excited. Um, and, and I feel at home, it's like, it reminds me of San Francisco in so many ways. But um, I'm here with a panel about growth stage investing, which seems to keep changing its meaning now that so many people are in the ecosystem investing at all stages. But, you know, I wanted to hear what you have to say about this. I mean, do you feel like there's too much competition? Is there too much money in the ecosystem these days or is it justified? Um, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Very happy to. I think, first of all, you have to put things in context in some way. So you, when you say there's a lot of money, when you look at Europe, in fact, uh, there's 80, I mean, Europe has, has has uh, taken 18% of the money worldwide that was invested in VCs this year. It was 10% three years ago. So we are rebalancing in some way. There's a lot of investors out there, institutional investors, uh, that are very attractive by the VC uh, class uh, and asset category, I would say, because this is delivering value. So those investors invest in, uh, in funds like ourselves. We invest in companies. Those companies invest in, in growth. And that creates like really, really good quality assets and that deliver return for those, you know, for those investors that are beating every other class of assets, in fact, if you look at one, five, ten years, for example. Um, so this is very interesting to them. And so when you say there's a lot of capital, they're coming for a reason, because there's good return in that uh, category, I would say. Yeah, what, what do you think right now? I mean, you've, you've worked at a few different growth stage places. Um, I think you were at SoftBank at one point. What do you think right now about all of the, the capital and the ecosystem? Yeah, of course, and I worked, at, I worked there alongside David, so we're all <laughs> okay. we <laughs> SoftBank alum, okay. Exactly, but um, before that, and, and where I initially, when I moved to Europe um, and started investing here, I worked at Atomico, which is a European-focused venture capital fund, and it was founded by one of the co-founders of Skype, Nicholas. And he originally founded it to solve his own pain points that he met as a founder, which was how underfunded Europe was and how an entrepreneur here had to go out to the valley and constantly heard that investors wanted them to move the companies to the valley. Um, and when in, in 2014, we ran a survey at Atomico and a founder at Series A in Europe was 14 times, had 14 times less capital available to them than the equivalent Series A founder in the US. So I think what you have to remember to put the question in context is Europe has been very underfunded um, and so now that's that's sort of rebalancing to, to David's point yeah I'll just echo what both of them said so literally I was just reading a pitch book report and I think there was 74 billion dollars done in Europe as of year to date that compares to eight seven or eight in 2011 and then 70 percent of that is growth yeah and you know um, I'm an LP and I have early stage exposure and what I've seen throughout the time period is um, the quality of the companies, it's just really exciting. And to David's point, there's growth capital for a reason. And I, I think it's a big positive because then founders have choices. Yeah, I agree. And both European funds and US funds. I agree. But I have to imagine as an investor, it might be really competitive. It might be harder to get deals you want to get access to if there's so many people willing to write checks. I mean, have you, have you had an issue with that? Who cares about us? I mean, <laughs> the reality is it provides more choice to the entrepreneurs. So, I mean, what we learned in doing VC uh, venture and helping entrepreneurs is that it takes several cooks in the kitchen to make a success at the end of the day. And so if there is more capital coming, if there is more funds that are able to offer like capital, but also value add to entrepreneurs in Europe, this is great. So entrepreneurs can build their dream team in some way between kind of the funds they want to work with, the investors they want to work with, and this is great for the ecosystem. To, to the point that was raised before is, I think European entrepreneurs have big dreams, and at some stage there was not enough people, and then there was not enough engineers, and there was not enough capital. Now the ecosystem is here. There's everything to make it happen, including plenty of investors. This is great. <laughs> and what do you, I mean, what do you think about the competitive landscape of investing right now in growth stage? No, I, I completely agree with David. I think it, it's definitely more competitive, um, but I think that that competition is positive for the ecosystem because that means that we have to work harder, we have to be more thoughtful, we have to work faster, um, and I think all of that means that we have to also be more helpful to entrepreneurs as a class of people. <laughs> and so I think that you know it, it, it's welcome, right, if you're passionate about the ecosystem as I am and if you're bullish on the, on the future. 
Um, so I don't do direct investing, but it is, one thing that I have found to be interesting is there's more competition at the growth stage, but then there's also more competition early. Yes. Right. So funds have expanded. Um, as we know, the valuations around, I don't even know how to define them anymore, but there's a lot of competition both earlier and later. So it's having impacts across kind of the whole spectrum. Yeah, and, and, and to that point, yeah, we are seeing funds like Tiger Global investing much earlier, and that's impacting a lot of things. I mean, do you think this is a good thing or a bad thing that some of these, you know, crossover investors are investing it much earlier than before? I think, like I said, I think it's good for entrepreneurs. Uh, I think different funds bring different value to, to entrepreneurs. Uh, some funds will bring capital. Uh, will bring very quickly. This is what Tiger offer. Uh, some of the fund at the other extreme, like, like our fund, uh, choose to bring value add to the, to the entrepreneur to help him or her to go through kind of uh, her or him, uh, his journey uh, and, and to make like a big company. And so these value propositions that are different and, and that's not a problem in some way. I think it just reflects on the quality of assets that exist in Europe. I mean, if so many Euro um, American or Asian investors come to Europe, is because Europe is creating companies that are becoming global leader. So if you look at you know, the history, this history was quite poor and kind of you know, global leader in tech built from Europe. There was like a couple of companies, but now you see more and more. So you have UiPath, you have Adyen from the Netherlands, et cetera, et cetera. You have Darktrace, et cetera. So you, I think entre, you know, investors are attracted by that. They want to invest in the best company in the world, and now they can find them here. So if they're coming, this is great. Seal of approval that we're creating those companies. I think the also thing, the other thing that's happened is technology has become a bigger and bigger sector as it's you know, in everything now, and companies are staying private longer. So those crossover, they used to be happy to wait for the Series D to be a public round. You know, now companies are doing E, F, G, right? It's all private, and then they started moving earlier, and I think because everything's become more competitive, they've started moving earlier as well. Um, I think there's, it, on, 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 a, on whole, it's positive. Um, I think what entrepreneurs need to be a little be careful about is when you raise big rounds really early, maybe before you have product market fit, um, you know, too much capital can also make you complacent. Um, whereas having less capital makes you think harder about every decision in some cases. Um, so I think in some cases it's, it's nuanced. Um, as a whole, I think more capital somewhere that was underfunded is gonna be obviously positive for the ecosystem. Well, yeah, you mentioned companies staying private longer, which was something I was hearing about for a while, but yeah. then all of a sudden last year and this year, a lot of companies did in fact go public and for some of them they did amazing on the stock market and others haven't, haven't done as well. I mean, what do you think right now is, is the latest thinking on that? I, you know, you obviously talk to a lot of companies that are at scale and could go public if they want to. It, do you feel like it's a good time to go public right now? I'm going to defer to our, our director. <laughs> okay, I'm happy to go first. Um, again, I think it really depends on the company. What, what I see is um, when these companies that are transforming different sectors and are trying to do really bold, ambitious things, um, enter a big market that's very competitive or launch an adjacent product or big M&A, they tend to choose to stay private if they can because it's easier to take those risks outside having to manage you know, public investors and being valued on an everyday basis. Um, when some, although sometimes companies then feel relatively mature and they want to do more things like M&A and having stock is actually really helpful for that. And they've had employees and investors for a long time and it just feels like the right time. Um, certainly what I see with funds is it's a good multiple environment right now versus to history. So there's a push to get liquidity where you know, founders you know, feel like it's the right time, which was why I think we've seen so many companies going public. But it's not always the right thing. Yeah, what do you think about the uh, public markets right now? I mean, is it a good time for companies at scale to, to brave the public markets? Or? Yeah, I, I totally agree. <laughs> I mean, it depends on, on the type of company you have, what you want to achieve. I mean, there's certain type of company, for example, when going public is good, you're in financial market, for example, you're in payment, going public has like huge brand and reputation impact, for example. Yeah? Um, there is some company for, for which it's not going to, to be the right answer because they want to continue to invest without having to report every quarter like result. Uh, and they want to continue to invest in innovation, for example. Uh, and they can do now that for a very long time because they can access uh, capital on the, on the private market. 
So it's going to be a choice, company per company. Uh, but, you know, this being said, it's quite good to see that many companies out of Europe are going public now, much more than before, uh, and, and they are doing that in Europe. Uh, and, and so this is a, a new trend as well. Some of them are still going to the US, but some of them are staying here in Europe. I mean, I was mentioning Adyen, for example, that, that IPO a couple of years ago, but they're based in Amsterdam, of all places, and this is one of the largest fintech, which is public, like, globally, I think. And, and I guess one thing that's happening in the public markets that's impacting private markets is, you know, some of the stocks that have done really well um, have brought up valuations in the private markets because of the comps. Um, and then, of course, you also have more capital in the ecosystem driving up valuations simultaneously. So what do you make of these really high valuations? Is it sustainable? Does it make you nervous? I mean, obviously, it's good from an exit perspective because you're making more money, but then for writing new checks like do you do you feel uneasy about these really high valuations yeah so valuation are very high um, not uh, not, a, not a news and of course as investors we feel nervous about it because I mean we, we are investing to help entrepreneurs create great company but on the other side of the marketplace we're investing to to make money to to people that invest in us yeah uh, and, and so of course we when we make Every time we, we make an investment, we want to be sure that we return to those institutions. Sometimes it's like paying the pension of like, you know, uh, public servant like, uh, in some countries. We want to be sure we return money to them. And so the entry point is very important. This being said, in, in the current context we are in, if you think about uh, the fact that this is what some people call the fourth, uh, you know, industrial revolution driven by data, AI, machine learning, etc., we are at a formidable, like, a point in history where great companies are going to be built. And so you don't want to be cheap on valuation if you think you're going to invest in a company which is going to be, I don't know, 100 billion, and, and, and the, uh, the, um, the, the, the potential are, are you know, very, very big. You don't want to be too cheap on valuation. This being said, I mean, we are seeing everything as investors. Sometimes those valuations are really crazy. <laughs> uh, and, you know, there's not a lot of, like, substance to it because people are going for high valuation for, you know, uh, uh, for, for many reasons. But sometimes those valuations are, you know, maybe six or 12 months in advance of a great trajectory. And in that, in that sense, you, you can see how this can make sense in some time. Yeah, what do you think about the sky high valuations? You know, it's interesting because we've been saying that valuations have been too high for a long time yeah. because we're not value investors. And so whenever you go invest in those great growth businesses, they've always felt expensive. And I think, you know, to get into the best companies and partner with the best entrepreneurs, it's always going to feel expensive. Um, I think our role, at least the way we think about it, is invest behind the trends you really believe in, the markets you think you understand something about, behind the teams that are going to execute the best. Um, and, and if all of that comes together, even if multiples compress, maybe you end up you know, partnering with a business years longer than you planned, but it'll still be a great company. Um, and you should be able to be okay. So we, we're much more you know, high conviction, thematic driven to withstand sort of multiple compression. But my observation is, you know, for the last nine years I've been investing in Europe in growth, it's always felt like you were pushing yourself and then it continues, you continue to just push yourself. <laughs> I would, I would echo what you said, and you can't sit out of the market, right? right. You just can't, because, and the outcomes, like David said, are really right. exciting, so as long as you're targeting that. Yeah. And then I think, you know, the only challenge we see in some of our managers is it, it tests fund construction. Yes. So if you raise a fund thinking the market might look that, the way it was at the time of the raise, and then it changes, you're being tested a little bit with reserves and check size and when to really push, which is just something you have to manage. Yes. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the differences between investing in Europe versus investing in Silicon Valley, where I'm from. I, I think, you know, one thing I've heard is that even though valuations are high here as well, they're not maybe as high as what you see in San Francisco. Uh, do you feel like that's the case? And, and, and also just curious about any other trends that you think are unique to Europe. Um, I think uh, on the valuation, I think in certain sectors they are fairly comparable. So if you take fintech, for example, I think it's one sector where valuation here, valuation in the US are like operating roughly on the same multiple. Um, and so in certain sectors, it's true Europe is cheaper. Um, and this is what helps us to create money as investors here, because it's kind of, uh, we, um, yeah, the, the multiple are kind of lower, if you want, when we enter companies, and it's cheaper to develop companies here than in downtown San Francisco, where, you know, everything is super expensive as well, I guess. Um, and so 
it's great for entrepreneurs to create an entrepre um, company from Europe and, and, and global giant from here because it's cheaper in some way. Um, so that's one. And versus the US, I think, I mean, to your point earlier, this is not competitive here versus the US, I think. <laughs> no, this is re really that. It's like, we, you know, there's many funds that invest now in Europe. They think this is super exciting. Uh, us too. I think in the US, there's even more competition for every deal. Um, so that's, you know, I feel good about that. Yeah, I know. I think, you know, again, I, I do, I have a more early stage exposure and I think like at seed, it's not quite the same yet, but there's sectors and types of companies that are exactly the same. And then as I think about, you know, some of the, the changes, um, one thing that's gotten me really excited is I feel, I feel like five or 10 years ago, the talent in Europe for scaling, there's always incredible talent to start companies, incredible technical talent, but the talent to really scale a company wasn't quite as robust a couple years ago, and you're just seeing it now. You're seeing it here live as some of the companies have scaled and people have taken those learnings, and I, I would guess you'd see that in your portfolios. But that was a change, and it feels like it, it isn't so much of a change now. I totally agree. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, in the US, you have had like the, the PayPal mafia at some stage that created like a bunch of great companies, etc. And we see people coming out of companies of first or second generation uh, in, in tech in Europe that are starting those type of companies now. So we see that effect of, you know, kind of in, uh, new entrepreneurs, I mean, entrepreneurs that come and this is like um, building on kind of, you know, the, the people that have done those first generation, I would say, of companies. Yeah, that's a great point with the PayPal mafia. You yeah. see that, I hear that a lot, where there's local tech ecosystems where one exit can all of a sudden generate new startups and then some of those grow up and yeah. so it becomes like a domino effect. And I'm curious, you know, what parts of Europe are you seeing the biggest, you know, domino effects right now? You know, which, which regions within Europe are you most excited about and why? You want to? Yeah, of course. One. So I think to that point, there are more mature ecosystems in Europe where the flywheel has been spinning for longer. The Nordics is a great example of that, right? If you think about Sweden and Spotify and Skype and now Klarna, to the extent that you have super angels um, and you also have a very deep bench of expertise, not only the founders, but you know, lots of marketing expertise, lots of scaling expertise in, in, in lots of different areas. And then you have emerging ecosystems. Um, I think Spain, Portugal, Italy are sort of on a trajectory and you're starting to see really big funding rounds and you'll start to see really big exits um, and that capital will go back to the ecosystem and some of the local early stage VCs um, have come from those from those exits, right? Like all Iron Ventures in, in Spain or Samaipata in Spain, they sold businesses and now they're reinvesting in the ecosystem. Um, and then another one that's really emerging as well and is getting stronger is Eastern Europe, um, where I think historically a lot of investors didn't spend a lot of time um, and is starting to churn, you know, bigger and bigger companies and with strengthening ecosystems from an operating skill set perspective. And maybe I could jump in because I'm curious how you guys think, how much was that driven by COVID? Because it was clearly happening before, right. but how much did it accelerate? I'm super curious. If yeah. You, yeah, I think, um, you know, COVID has made the world flat again, right? Because I think two things happen. One, access to capital for companies that were in remote locations that investors might not have accessed, right? Um, whether it was like Lithuania or Bucharest or whatever it was. Um, so I think that's definitely happened. And the second thing I've seen with my companies is the management teams or senior leadership teams tolerance for hiring people and employing people that might not sit in the HQ or the mothership or one of the offices, right? So, you know, now be happy with people sitting anywhere in Eastern Europe or anywhere else if that's where they want to sit to access the great talent. Yeah. So accelerated by COVID, but the movement has started before in yeah. some way. So if you come, if you go back, I don't know, five, seven years ago, the majority of company would be created like in London, Berlin, Paris. Now, this is not anymore the case, in fact. So you still have companies created in London, Paris, and Berlin, but a lot of them are now created, you know, to, to, um, to, to a point about, you know, in, in, in the Nordics, in Eastern Europe, in Southern Europe, et cetera, et cetera. And COVID has kind of just like you lit like that matches. And we actually see that in our underlying portfolio. So we have lagged data, but what we see is that more of our U.S. investors are investing in Europe and not investing in the traditional hubs, and right. especially the ones that are thesis driven or very focused, because yes. I think that makes it much easier than um, to kind of do your sourcing and get conviction, but it's yeah. Yeah. kind of exciting. It is cool. 
And we talked a little bit about the IPO exit market, but I'm just curious about M&A. It's one thing I like to write about, but now that valuations are so high, is it too expensive for your companies to get bought? Or are, you, are they getting offers? Or like, what's happening? I think, I don't know. Is he, a couple of years ago, company created in Europe Will, a lot of them would finish in M&A in, in some way and be acquired by like, you know, big companies, etc. And I think the, the entrepreneurs have totally changed their mind here in Europe. They're like, why are we doing M&A here? We can create big companies. <laughs> we are here for the long run. So we see more and more entrepreneurs that come with big ambition and their ambition doesn't stop at like, you know, being bought like in three years time. They want to go there like for the duration and create like a very big and exciting companies. That, that's what they're excited at. Now, M&A still happens. Um, I think this is a sign that you know, a lot of innovation happened here. Uh, and, and so big groups are coming and doing equity hire, like the, the, the Google, et cetera, this world. Uh, and, and that won't stop. But I think there is less entrepreneurs that are open to this from the start, I would say, versus kind of building something like really big. Yeah, I think one of the main changes has been with more capital in the ecosystem. You know, in the past, entrepreneurs had to, because there wasn't growth capital really, entrepreneurs either had to drive their business to profitability, so you could take a lot less risk, um, or you'd sell early, because somehow you took a risk and it didn't pay off. And now there's all this money coming in early stage, so they can really go big um, and are getting big. Um, of course, the larger you become, the smaller becomes your universe of acquirers. Um, but, you know, you have to think that there's new massive acquirers, right? Like the Adyens of the world at 70 billion yeah. market cap. So those are constantly getting bigger. Um, keeping cash on the balance sheet in euros is not the most advisable thing because you're just constantly losing money. So it's good to deploy money in M&A. Um, so I think you're, you're seeing larger M&As, and I was just trying to think of some, and I thought of you know, Etsy buying Depop in the Balderton portfolio, right? That was a $2 billion acquisition, so relatively sizable. Um, so I think that'll happen, but I think now with more capital, the entrepreneurs that have you know, flying business models will try to go public, but then those companies become acquirers as well. Yeah. I don't have anything to add except that I'm so excited these companies are trying to be huge. It's like so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well on that note, thank you so much. It was great to get your insights on growth stage in Europe VC. So, um, and great to be here with everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.